Sure. Um, as you know, our, our panel is centered on Shugendo, Japan's mountain, sort of main mountain-based tradition. Now, the modern study of Shugendo is, I think it's sort of rooted in folk studies. Uh, Minzoku Gaku, I think a, a lot of us would, would agree on that. Um, and alongside maybe a desire to recover much what of what was lost during the Meiji era of prohibition. And I think, you know, much of these effects of the Minzoku Gaku approach still linger with us. Uh, and, and our work uh, here today and, and outside of this panel too is um, trying to push back on this legacy. Uh, in the panel today, we do so by exploring um, its historical spread and localization through uh, a number of cases in ways that we hope will um, begin to remove it from that kind of modern legacy of um, being portrayed in, in sort of vague, uh, romantic and, and nation bound terms. So um, with that said, let me introduce our speakers here. Uh, Karina Roth is uh, here. Um, she's gonna be our first speaker. Her talk is titled Enno Gyoja, A Patriarch Forever in the Making. Uh, next is Andrea Castiglioni, and Andrea's paper is titled Transposing the Mountains, the Sanzan Paradigm from the Key Peninsula to the Tohoku region. And he'll even get into Nico too a little bit if we're lucky. Um, my name is Caleb Carter and I will give the last talk. Uh, the title of mine is Interwoven Threads, Parallels in uh, Early Modern Shugendo and Shinto. And then we're delighted to have uh, I read Averbutch um, give some comments to kind of get conversation going. And we hope to have plenty of time for uh, questions from, from everyone uh, once we're finished. Um, so without further ado, oh, maybe just a uh, thank you to the organizers at EAJS and Ghent, uh, you know, overcoming the obstacle of, of online. You've done a great job and to our tech assistant today too. Um, and when we do get to discussion, we uh, prefer just the hand raising function. And if you're having mm -hmm. trouble with that, then you can use the Zoom chat too. Um, and so without further ado, Karina, would you like to share Thanks. your slides and begin? There we go. And then if everyone else is just a reminder, if you could turn off your mics. Mm, yeah. Okay. So shall I get going? Okay. okay. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to, to the AGSD organizer. I'm very impressed by the complexity and the smoothness with, uh, with which everything works this week and thank you for and thank you to Caleb for organizing this panel and for always being so nice and dynamic I'm so happy to see you all and even if it's virtually it's just nice to see your names see your faces <laughs> okay so let's go to and see what we have around Enno Gyoja so Enno Gyoja and the practitioner wait why does this 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 doesn't this work okay Enno Gyoja and the practitioner is the most common name given to the traditional founder of Shugendo, the way to powers through practice. The only so-called historic source mentioning Enno Gyoja is a brief two-line sketch of his life in Shoku Nihongi, the sequel to the Japanese chronicles Nihon Shoki. Despite the faintness of his record, Enno Gyoja is overall treated as a semi-historical figure to this day. What has been ascertained over the past decades is that Shugendo as an independently structured religious movement appeared towards the end of the 13th century and that Enno Gyoja is said to have lived in the second half of the 7th century. This means that his being seen as the head of Shugendo practitioners is necessarily a case of retrospective history in Suzuki Masataka's terms. My intention in this paper is to examine the figure of Enno Gyoja at two different moments in the creation of Shugendo. We will first look at the early medieval period when Shugendo was yet to be defined as an independent religious movement and then turn to the beginning of the 20th century when Shugendo was truly, truly reinventing itself in the wake of its dissolution under the religious reforms of the Meiji Restoration. Shugendo is notoriously difficult to outline as a discrete and distinct religious movement. It is known for centering on ascetic practices in the mountains and for aiming to acquire special powers by these practices. Among the many reasons that make Shugendo so elusive is the fact that it was extremely widespread in the whole of Japan until 1872, when it was prohibited along with many 
other religious movements that rely on a diversity of practice and hence are condemned for advocating superstitions. Computations by different scholars show that about 10% of the Japanese population was affiliated in one way or another to Shigendo before Meiji, which is difficult to imagine nowadays as Shigendo has become a very minor religious current in Japan. To be recognizable, a religious movement needs a distinct body of practices and ideas, but it generally also needs a founder figure that coalesces its defining features, symbolizes and heralds them. The recognition value is more important than the historic value. Many, if not most, perhaps all religious founders have legendary traits. In some cases, both facets, historical and legendary cohabit. Kukai, for example, the founder of the Japanese Shingon school has both, has both a clearly historical track via the text and commentaries that are traceable to his authorship and a clearly legendary track. Under the posthumous name of Kobo Daishi, he is the subject of innumerable legends and miracles feats throughout Japanese history. In other cases, the historical facets are tenuous and more difficult to identify. Shotoku Taishi, whose 14th memorial is being celebrated this year, is a case in point. Seen for centuries as an exemplary regent and as the first official promulgator of Buddhism while being a layman, Shotoku Taishi's historical record has also been dissected and convincingly shown to be a constructed figure inspired from several different historical persons. Although Shotoku is not technically a religious founder, he was turned into the main channel through which Buddhism was officially brought to Japan. At the same time, Shotoku became very early on a cult figure of his own as a manifestation of canon. While Shotoku and Enno Gyoja are very different figures, they are comparable in relation with each other at different times. First, let's take a look at what is known of Enno Gyoja. Two lines in Shokunihong, the two lines in Shokunihongi portrayed Enno Gyoja as a master in spells with no explicit connection to Buddhism. A few decades later, Nihon Ryoiki, the oldest anthology of Buddhist didactic, didactic tales, gave a fuller account of his life which provided the mode for most of Enno Gyoja's subsequent hagiographies. Here, Enno Gyoja is already depicted as a Buddhist practitioner under the name Enno Obasaku, En the lay practitioner. The main axis of Ryoiki's account is Enno Gyoja's slander by either Hirotari, one of his disciples, or Hitokoto Nushi, the main deity of the Katsuragi range. The accusation of insurrection is followed by Enno Gyoja's banishment until his eventual ambiguous rehabilitation. In both cases, he is described as having special powers resulting from his religious practice in the mountains. Governmental edicts during the Nara period tried to rein in a range of religious activities taking place in forests and mountains, hinting at the possibility of sedition or other un uncontrollable events. And Nogyoja is seen as being part of that potentially destabilizing category of persons. Yet, religious practice in the mountain was considered an integral, integral part of Buddhism in ancient Japan. The figure of Enno Gyoja emerged from this background and was gradually linked to the figures of Yamabushi, literally those who lie down in the mountains, as one of the names given to religious practitioners secluding themselves in mountain areas. One of the earliest examples um, of that connection is to be, to be found in Shin Sarugaki, which features a satirical description of Enno Gyoja as a second-rate practitioner, a quote, who barely knows more than one Dharani, end of quote. The fact that his account, this account is parodic is in itself an indication that the figure of Enno Gyoja must have been recognizable at the time and associated with a background of religious practice in the mountains. Since Enno Gyoja is described as the head of all Yamabushi, it means that a certain level of structure must have been perceived among that strand of practitioners. But when does the connection between Enno Gyoja and Shugendo occur? Although none of them used the expression Shugen or Shugendo, the earliest documents that indicate a religious structure around Enno Gyoja and are written from an insider point of view date back to the second half of the 12th century. 
For example, in both Kimpusen Hong Engi and Shozan Engi, Ennogyoja is portrayed as the ancestor of all Yamabushi, who quite literally, quite literally walk in his steps in different mountain areas. According to Kawasaki Tsuyoshi, who has worked extensively on early Shugendo literature, for Shugendo to gain credentials as a distinct strand of Buddhism, it needed to find ways to integrate Buddhist orthodoxy. For that, it required a scriptural basis and a founding figure. Kawasaki sees both elements combined in founding narratives of temples and shrines that center on Ennogyoja. So today, I would like to look at one textual example taken up by Kawasaki, that of Mino Deraengi, a document compiled at the latest in the latter half of the 12th century and describing the foundation of the temple at Mino in Setsu province. The text describes how Ennogyoja, in a dream, visits the new land of Ryuju Bosatsu, Nagarjuna, situated in the dragon cave of Mino's waterfall. During this visit, Ennogyoja is bestowed a ritual akin to esoteric Buddhist consecration in the presence of both Ryuji Bosatsu and Benzaitan. Once Ennogyoja completed his visits and woke up from his dream, he founded the temple at Minon. Kawasaki highlights the fact that through this dream consecration ritual, Ennogyoja fully enters Shingon lineage, since Ryuji Bosatsu, also known as Ryumyo, was the first or the third patriarch in the Shingon tradition. In a few lines, Mino de Raengi thus manages to transform Ennogyoja into an avant-garde Shingon practitioner more than a hundred years before Kukai himself. How, influen how influential was this interpretation? In several articles, Kawasaki demonstrated on the one hand that high-ranking Kofkuji monks, such as um, Kakuken and Joke, reworked parts of Mino de Raengi into other documents and that many hagiographic entries on Ennogyoja in later encyclopedies were based on that text. The passage examined by Shikawasaki shows how a single image, that of Ennogyoja being consecrated by a lineage patriarch, is enough to create orthodoxy. The example drawn from Mino de Raengi is not the only uh, attempt to co-opt Ennogyoja, nor was Ennogyoja the sole contender for the position of founder of Shugendo. Shosa Engi, long considered to be a forerunner of Shugendo thought, offers a window on different attempts to transform Ennogyoja into both a founding figure and a vector of unification between different sites of mountain practice. It contains what is probably the oldest hagiography of Ennogyoja from a Shugen point of view, much of which relies on Nihon Ryoiki's account. It also includes fringe references to other figures, for example, Zendo, described as the initiator of mountain practice of, on Omine, as well as the first administrator of Kumano. Ennogyoja's uncle Gangyo is also mentioned as an early practitioner who taught Ennogyoja. Moreover, many regional sites of mountain practice have their founder, who is sometimes supplanted by Ennogyoja, sometimes not. Ennogyoja presented the advantage of already having a certain aura, since the most major compilations of Buddhist tales included his Hadjimoto. As we have seen in the example of Mino de Raengi, the very fact that it was so sketchy was of advantage, as it rendered the circumstances of his life more adaptable. Still in Shozaengi, for example, Ennogyoja is modeled into a wholly different lineage from the one presented in Mino de Raengi. Rather than be, being inserted into Shingon orthodoxy, Ennogyoja is integrated into an equally grandiose genealogy, that of the ancestors of the Kumano deities. Via an elaborate use of the Honji Sushi paradigm, combining manifestation and ancestorship in this case, Ennogyoja was inserted into an Indian Buddhist and royal pedigree on the basis of a convoluted mimetic tale. In the earliest form, in their earliest form, accounts of Anyogyoja's life had little substance to indicate a doctrinal leaning. The very absence of um, clear religious affiliation was compensated by his charisma as an, uh, as an ascetic practitioner. Oh, I see that there's a chat. Anyway. Oh, sorry. 
Um, the examples I've presented so far all date back to the times in which Shugendo had yet to create its imprint and was on the verge of becoming an actual religious movement. All of them show how important it is once a founding figure is chosen to model it according to one's needs. At the medieval and pre-modern period, Shugendo has had a complex history and many, in many ways played a vital role in Japanese history until its suppression in 1872. It took the end of World War II and the new Japanese constitution for Shugendo to be rehabilitated. Contrary to the worst fears, however, Shugendo did not die out. The fears that Shugendo documents and traditions would be lost forever conducted a group of people centering on Umi a Shugendo practitioner from northern Japan, to collect as many texts and documents as possible. Recently, several scholars, including Hayashi Makoto Izu, have given detailed accounts of the process through which Umiura and several others managed to not only preserve Shigendo material and textual knowledge, but also promote it via different channels. One of these channels was the Japanese Buddhist canon, Nihon Daizokyo, under the, edited, under the, the, and edited under the direction of Nakano Tatsue uh, between 1914 and 1921. Thanks to Umiura's dedication on the one hand, Nakano's interest in Shugendo, on the other, the Daizokyo came to include three volumes dedicated to Shugendo material. Another channel was the creation of several journals dedicated to Shugendo documents and venues. The earliest is Jimban, which started in 1909 and was directly affiliated, and still is, to, to Daigoji, i.e. Shingon Buddhism. A decade later, two other journals saw the light. One of them was Shugen Genkyu, by, uh, published by Shugen Kenkyusha in Shizuoka Prefecture. The other was Shugen, published under the aegis of Shouwoin and later renamed Honzan Shugen. Both Jimben and Honzan Shugen tend to cater to their own practitioners and are still published today, whereas Shugen Kenkyu was unusual in having a broader cross-sectarian audience in mind. Despite the differences, all three journals shared partly the same pool of writers and editors, centering on Umiura Giken, Umiwa Shinya, and Ushkubo Kozen. The first objective of these joint efforts was to save as much as possible of the vast cultural heritage of Shugendo for fear that the Meiji policies would achieve their aim of eradication. By rendering Shugendo sources available to a general audience, the hope was also to gain public recognition of their value and thereby to rehabilitate Shugendo on a grand scale in managing to highlight its place, not only within Japanese Buddhism, but within Mahayana Buddhism as a whole. In order to achieve these aims, the group focused on two famous semi-historical figures, Shotoku Taishi and Enno Gyoja. Shotoku represented a moral and political ideal, and Enno Gyoja was presented as his spiritual ear. Hayashi showed how Umira and his acolytes saw in Shotoku Taishi the precursor of Shugendo. According to Umura, as quoted in Hayashi, Shotoko is the principal initiator of the culture in our country. He centered the roots of Japanese civilization on Buddhism, formulated the 17th Article Legal Code, and set the foundations for the government. Our Enokimi Jinben Daibosatsu admired the spirit of Shotoku and widely diffused Mahayana Buddhism by performing Shugendo as a commoner in mountains, forests, and households." End of quote. It is important to pinpoint that Enno Gyoja is placed in direct correlation with Shotoku, with whom he shares the will to widely diffuse Mahayana Buddhism, as well as the status of a layman. Simultaneously, the ecumenical stance of Umiura's group, whose aim it was to go beyond sectarian affiliations, should be underlined. In that, the choice of Shotoku Taishi is particularly helpful. Shotoku allows to bypass Fuka and Saichu. Moreover, Enno Gyoja can conveniently be placed between Shotoku on the one side and the esoteric. On the side. In the second issue of Jinben, Omiwa Shinya goes as far as stating that all the pat uh, patriarchs of Japan's most successful Buddhist schools, I quote, dedicated themselves to the teaching of Enno Kimi Ozun, end of quote and that he was in there following Enno Gyoja's footsteps that they were able to develop their own schools. 
In Shugen, long articles on Endo Gyocha, divided over a series of episodes, feature prominently, mostly under the traditional forms of, form of hagiographies, following a standard succession of episodes in the founder's life. Almost no issue of the journal goes by without at least one portion devoted to him, with heavy emphasis on Endo Gyocha, and Endo Gyocha's role as a true pioneer, both in terms of seniority and in fearless exploration until the farthest recesses of the country. This interpretation of Endo Gyocha's role at the origins of Shugendo, but ultimately and ideally at the very source of Japanese religiosity, was there to last. It has been fueled by the field of Japanese ethnology, Minzoku Gaku, as Kelly was pointing out, throughout the 20th century and to a lesser extent to this day. My aim in this presentation was to examine the way in which the figure of Endo Gyocha is constructed at two different points in time separated by several, several centuries, but united in the fact that in both cases, the features of Shugendo as a distinct and independent religious current need to be clarified and established. In the medieval period, Shugendo was emerging as a structured movement, and the diversity in representations of the figure of Enno Gyoja is proof not only of his fame and diffusion at the time, but also that different images um, of him were competing. Already at that time, there were discourses aiming at placing him at the top of Japanese religious figures. The second period that we have examined is the beginning of the 20th century. At the time, the prohibition of Shugendo in the wake of the religious policies of the Meiji period had brought about a variety of measures aiming at preventing Shugendo documents mm -hmm. and teachings to disappear altogether. The fact that Shugendo had officially and technically been dismantled, dismantled revived the questions of the delineating features of this religious current. This automatically meant a renewed reflection on the role and function of his alleged founder. In that sense, both situ situations are indeed comparable. And we have seen that the tools used in the medieval period functioned in similar ways in that context too. At the end of the 13th century, it was necessary to position Shugendo above other relig religious traditions rather than within them. Since the accent was set on esoteric Buddhism, Shugendo needed arguments that would allow it to appear as greater than Tendai and Shingon Buddhism. As Kawasaki has shown, the Mino episode was used to prove that point by claiming both anteriority and superiority in lineage. In the early 20th century, by contrast, the accent was set on different elements. Although the esoteric initiation was not left out, it was more important to posit Enno Gyoja on equal terms with Shotoku Taishi, emphasizing the role of both figures as cultural her heroes in combining the purport of Buddhism and that of state protection. Although the circ circumstances of both periods in time were widely different, they are both moments in which Shugendo was defining itself and its role in Japanese society. Enno Gyoja provided a supple yet dynamic mold in which to project the movement's aspirations with just the right touch of ambiguity, fierceness, and rebelliousness to fit uncertain times. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Karina. Uh, wow. Okay. I don't, I don't have a, a slide of you, Caleb. I, I will take care to put in one in my next PowerPoint. My apologies. <laughs> okay. Allora, uh, okay. So, so my presentation is uh, on the transition of the Sanzan paradigm from Key Peninsula to the Tohoku region. So, you know that in Shugendo tradition, sacred mountains were not conceived um, as static natural environments, but as a living microcosm, which could uh, um, welcome or reject humans, uh, fly in the air, and even replicate themselves in different geographical locations. So in today's presentations, I focus on the transposition mechanisms which characterize 
the dissemination of the cult of the three Kumano mountains, so Kumano Sanzan, from the key peninsula uh, to the Tohoku region toward the end of the uh, 13th uh, century. Uh, this is a crucial historical moment, uh, not simply for the expansion of the uh, uh, Kumano Sanzan cult beyond imperial network and the aristocratic elites of Kyoto to where either to unexplore uh, peripheries, but also and most prominently for the consolidation of Shugendo as uh, a sectarian movement within the boundaries of the medieval exoesoteric Buddhism, as uh, Karina just told us a few minutes ago. Before describing the historical aspects concerning the recreation of the Kumano Sanzan paradigm within the Dewa uh, domain, which is in present day Yamagata prefecture, I want to concentrate on uh, a few uh, theoretical elements which are embedded in the uh, concept uh, of uh, transposition, but also extend to the notion of transmission, tradition, original, and copy. When taking into account uh, hybridization processes between Shugendo mountains, I think that uh, uh, J.Z. Smith's uh, definition of transposition uh, can be particularly useful. So for Smith, transposition is, and I quote, uh, a paradigmatic process set within largely syntagmatic series of actions which characterize the ritual. The respect in which uh, this might, under certain circumstances, also be a that gives rise to a thought which plays uh, across gaps of like and unlike." Unquote. Uh, in our specific case, it is possible to say that uh, Kumano Sanzan uh, differed from uh, Dewa Sanzan and at the same time was also identical to it. Uh, in other words, uh, Dewa Sanzan was interpreted as um, a geophysical manifestation of uh, Kumano Sanzan within uh, the natural landscape of the uh, Northeastern region uh, for meeting devotional needs of the people living in this area. Nevertheless, the transposition of a sacred mountain uh, with its complex uh, pantheon of Buddhas and Kami from one side to another was not a mere overlapping between between two geographical landscapes, but implied the inoculation of extra local cultic discourses into a local specific religious context. This means uh, that the Kumano Sanzan cult had to uh, slightly modify its uh, original structure um, in order to be accepted and spread among the Tohoku populations. This capability to change is not only the engine of transmission, but also of tradition, which does not provide uh, an acritical replication of the past, but a constant betrayal or creative adjustment of it in order to stay in tune with the present space and time of reality. Devotional practices focused on Kumano Sanzan took root in uh, the Tohoku region only because they were modified and revised to match with the uh, already existing characteristics of the religious panorama of this territory. It is also clear that the power uh, relationship between uh, the original Kumano Sanzan in the key peninsula and its copy or double uh, uh, Dewa Sanzan in the Tohoku is not monodirectional but multidirectional. If it is true that uh, uh, at the beginning of the transposition process, Kumano Sanzan worked as a, a foundational paradigm for providing religious authority to the Dewa Sanzan, it is also true that once established, Dewa Sanzan progressively detached from the origin and at the beginning of the 17th century, independently originated its own copy or double pollinating the mountainous area of Nikko. It goes without saying that the continuous overlapping process between Shugendo Mountains, the legitimacy uh, of the original and the subordination of the copy was immediately lost and replaced by the mutual fertilizing tension between porous networks of sacred peaks. So the oldest written source which, testify, uh, which testifies uh, uh, to uh, the religious activities connected to the transposition of the Kumano Sanzan cult to the northern domains is a 1278 legal contract that ratifies the uh, transfer of administrative rights over a group of uh, Kumano Sanzan parishioners at Danna based in the uh, uh, Taicho village uh, of the Dewa domain to a Kumano Sendatsu called Sodobo. 
Kumano Sendatsu or Kumano Guides were the human actors who uh, practically foster the uh, tra uh, translation of the Kumano Sanzan cult into various Tohoku provinces, ritually funding and administratively organizing local parishes made of religious confraternities uh, of lay devotees who worship the deities associated with the three sacred sites of Kumano, namely Hongu, Shingu, and Nachi. So the name uh, Kumano Sendatsu denoted uh, heterogeneous groups of uh, itinerant religious professionals who performed a wide range of different ritual practices while sharing a common devotional focus on Kumano Sanza, uh, the natural environment of which provided the site for their ascetic practices, the Shugyo, and the legitimizing source for their religious activities. A relevant part of Kumano Sendatsu were uh, mountain ascetics, so Yamabushi, who had some sort of affiliation with temples associated with the Tendai network of Shugendo, so it is, uh, we're talking about uh, Honzanha, but uh, the variety of those religious professionals called Kumano Sendatsu extend far beyond Yamabushi. Uh, among Kumano Sendatsu, there were also experts in uh, chanting uh, of the Buddha's names, so Nembutsu Hijiri, found rising itinerant religious performers, Kanjin Hijiri, uh, itinerant ascetics uh, from Mount Koya, Koya Hijiri, Kumano itinerant uh, female practitioners, Kumano Bikuni, who often specialize in oral narrative uh, um, uh, connected uh, with the um, ritual. Um, with the ritual display of devotional paintings of Kumano landscapes, such as the famous uh, Kumano E or Kumano Mandala. Female shamans were also there, the Miko, who were expert in uh, aesthetic uh, possessions. So the necessity to extend uh, the financial basis of the religious uh, institutions of Kumano beyond the support of uh, emperors and provincial authorities inspired the activities of the Kumano Sendatsu, who became the human mediators sent to whom the sacred geography of this mountainous range could be transmogrified into new sites. But how could Kumano uh, Sanzan and its multi-layer pantheon of Buddhas and Kami be practically transposed from one location to another? So Kumano Sendatsu employed a ritual technology based on uh, the invitation protocol, the Tanjo Gire, which was normally used during the Dharma assemblies, the, the Hoi, to summon those Kami who were granted the status of uh, Dharma protectors, the Ho Go Hojin, together with Buddhists and Bodhisattva for supervising the exposition of the Dharma made by Buddhist monks. In the case of Kumano Sanzan, it was arguable that Kumano Sendatsu invited the three kami of uh, Hongu, Shingu, and Nachi, together with their um, original Buddhas. Uh, it is Ketsumiko no Mikoto, the Honjibutsu Amida Nyorai, Hayatama no Okami, the Honjibutsu Yakushi Nyorai, and uh, Fusumi uh, no Okami, Honjibutsu Senju Kanon, and the five princesses, the Gosho Oji, to specific lots of land in the northeastern region where they were enshrined into pavilions. It is interesting to take into account that among the five princesses, uh, the cult of the last one, uh, Komori no Miya, the Honjibutsu Shokanon, was particularly widespread in the Tohoku region, probably due to the fact that a strong worship of this type of canon predated the diffusion of the Kumano Sanzan cult. For example, uh, uh, Miyauchi Kumano Taisha in Nanyo area uh, can be considered one of the most ancient Kumano Sanzan shrines founded by Kumano Sendatsu in the 13th uh, century. Uh, its devotional triptych uh, is constituted by three wooden statues of the original Buddhas of Kumano, namely Amida Nyorai, Shokanon, and Yakushi Nyorai. In normal conditions, uh, the central deity should be Amida Nyorai, Hongu, uh, but in the case of Miyauchi Kumano Taisha, the Sendats manipulated the original Kumano Sanzan paradigm, giving to Kanon, Nachi, the central position and placing Amida and Yakushi on either side. Kumano Sendatsu also tweaked the Honjibutsu of Nachi from Senju Kanon to Sho Kanon in order to meet with the worshipping taste of the devotees living in this area. We have seen at the beginning of this talk, hybridity and flexibility rather than preservation and stability are two fundamental qualities for an effective cultic transposition. 
So it seems clear that uh, materiality played a pivotal role in the diffusion of the Kumano Sanzan cult. In particular, Kumano Sendatsu relied on portable materiality, which facilitated their movements on the ground and could be easily disseminated among new communities of potential devotees. Uh, three were uh, the most important objects for their religious activities. Hanging Buddha uh, plaques, the Kake Botoke, uh, for displaying the true body uh, of the Kami of Kumano in the shape of original Buddhas outside the shrines. Mirror icons, the Kyozo, and the Ox Bezoar talismans, the Go O Hoin uh, of Nachi, which were highly prized for their apotropaic and healing qualities. Different from Kake Botoke and Go, Go O Hoin, uh, which shared a visible and public function, Kyozo were extremely expensive and private objects, which were used as visual and devotional supports to envision the combinatory patterns between original Buddhas and praise kami during, the, uh, during meditation. The type of honjibutsu transmitted through the Kyozo was strongly influenced by the intellectual productions of the Agui tradition of the Tendai school. Therefore, it is possible to suppose that certain Honzanha Yamabushi operated as Kumano Sendats in the Tohoku region must have been acquainted with such theories. According to the Agui tradition, the mirror itself represents the true body of the kami, which overlapped with the ultimate reality of the Dharmakaya, while the images reflected on its surface were simply the Nirmanakaya. The Kyozo was also conceived as a, a material representation of the practitioner's body-mind, which was the physical resonance of the kami within the human body. It goes without saying that the uh, different level of intellectual complexity embedded in the Kumano Sanza materiality shows that Kumano Sendatsu targeted at the same time a general audience of standard devotees and a more sophisticated group of parishioners for whom they set aside different types of objects, such as the Kyozo, in addition to the other paraphernalia. To create a religious confraternity dedicated to the cult of Kumano Sanzan in the Tohoku area meant that Kumano Sendatsu and their networks of local proxies, such as Yamabushi or lay co administrators, the Sewanin, had to uh, uh, keep providing their uh, parishes with uh, ritual practices as well as religious items. <clears throat> Only in this way were Kumano Sendatsu able to attract the necessary financial revenue in the guise of offerings for sustaining uh, uh, other um, expansive cultural activities on the territory. Among the most ambitious uh, projects launched by Kumano Sendatsu for spreading the cult of Kumano Sanzan in the northeastern domains was the geo uh, ritual remapping of a vast uh, mountainous area in the Dewa province, which started to be venerated as a, a, a geophysical avatar of uh, uh, Kumano Sanza. In the 17th century, this hologram of the mandalic landscape of Kumano in the Dewa province was simply referred to as the Three August Mountains, uh, um, Sanza no Mia. Entering uh, the natural environment of Dewa Sanzan pilgrims could also virtually access the pure lands and hells of uh, Kumano Sanzan because the three Dewa mountains were conceived as reverberations of Hongu, Shingu, and Nachi. Nevertheless, in the case of Dewa Sanzan, uh, the uh, exact structure of the uh, three mountains paradigm was never stable, but always in motion. For example, in 1600, the powerful daimyo Mogami Yoshiaki ratified a military alliance with other provincial warlords, uh, signing a north, a Kishomon, on the back of which the names of the gods associated with Dewa Sanzan were Gassan, Haguro, and Ayama Daigongen. According to other coeval written sources, the three mountains of Dewa refer to Gassan, Haguro, and Chokai. So it is evident that uh, the Sanzan paradigm was supposed to shift according to the religious preferences and, uh, and the pilgrimage routes chosen by the devotees. For instance, for pilgrims who entered the Dewa province uh, from the lands on the northern side of the Mogami River, the veneration of Choka represented an almost inevitable logistic and ritual moment, while for those who arrived from south via Maruyama, Mount Hayama was the first cultic site on the way toward the Shonai Plain. 
either northern Dewa Sanzang, Chokai, Gassan, Haguro, or southern Dewa Sanzang, Hayama, Gassan, Haguro, the triad of original Buddhas, Yakushi Nyorai, Amida Nyorai, Shokan, substantially overlapped with the archetypical triad of original Buddhas at Kumano Sanzang. Nevertheless, uh, all the sacred mountains of the Dewa province, uh, different from those of uh, uh, Kumano, also had a shared inner crescent, uh, a shared Okuno in, which was uh, Mount Yudono. The original Buddha associated with this sacred boulder called Gohozen, which is constantly enveloped in a thin layer of hot water, was Dainichi Nyora. Toward the end of the 17th century, Yudono was still considered to be the shared Okuno Inn for all the mountains of the area, but at the same time, we, uh, was also included within the triadic structure of Dewa Sanza, which crystallized as Haguro, Yudono, and Gassa. The incorporation of Yudono inside the Sanzan paradigm was probably politically motivated by the Haguro's attempt to strengthen its control over an extremely exuberant religious center such as Yudono. Moreover, the inclusion of uh, Yudono within the Sanzan paradigm marked the definitive independence of the copy, the Sanzan, from the original Kumano Sanzan. Uh, with the absorption of Yudono within the Dewa Sanzan, the Buddhist pantheon of the three mountains turned into Shokanon, Haguro, Dainichi Nyorai, Yudono, and Amida Nyorai, Gassan, detaching from the primordial Kumano triad, Yakushi Nyorai, Shingu, Amida Nyorai, Hongo, and Senju Kanon Nachi. We should also take into account that the presence of Yudono and its Honjibutsu Dainichi Nyorai within the Sanzan Pantheon also created a few distortions in the uh, spatio-temporal and, and soteriological frames within which these three Buddhas and Bodhisattva were supposed to operate. In the Kumano Sanzan framework, Amida took care of the post-mortem salvation of the pilgrims, while Yakushi Nyorai and Senju Kanon focused on bestowing worldly benefits uh, for the present life. A Dewa Sanzan show canon was worshipped for uh, uh, receiving worldly benefits in the present life, Amida for extinguishing the karmic load of negative actions in previous lives, and Dainichi Nyorai was in charge to lead the body mind of the pilgrim toward the Buddhahood in this life or after death, de facto conflicting with some of the fundamental uh, function of the other Buddhist and Bodhisattva in both uh, Sanzan paradigms. The beginning of the 17th century marked not only the definitive emancipation of Dewa Sanzan from Kumano Sanzan, but also the export of this uh, double or copy of Dewa Sanzan into another sacred uh, mountainous site, it is Nikko. In 1624, Tenkai and Yoe, the superintendent of Nikko, ritually invited Yudono Gongen to the site, fostering a ceremonial conflation between the mandalic geography of Dewa Sanzan and the territory of Nikko. As a result, uh, Yudono Gongen was enshrined on Mount Nantai and in the plain of uh, Funasawa. Gassan Gongen transferred to Mount Taru and Mount Ozaksan, while Haguro Gongen was associated with Urami Gataki on the backside of Jakoji. So this is a talisman of Ozakusan, and the name Ozakusan is written in small character on the right side. The real protagonist of this talisman is the mountain that is not actually there. It's Gassan. The virtual doubling of Mandalic mountains allowed Edo pilgrims to perform ascetic practices into, uh, into different nominal sites at the same time. In other words, to make a real pilgrimage to Nikko allowed devotees to perform also a virtual one to the remote three mountains of Dewa. Of Dewa. Once Dewa Sanzan became able to expand its religious authority so much as creating an impression of its pantheon on another territory, it can be said that it upgraded to the level of matrix like Kumano Sanzan did in the 13th century. Let's now focus on uh, a few final thoughts. So one, the dissemination of the Sanzan paradigm from Kumano to Dewa and from there to Nikko shows that there is no divide between nature and culture, but both elements constitute a symbiotic organism which can merge with other similar organisms in different space and time. Two, human actors, Kumano, San, uh, Sendatsu, uh, Shugenja, Hijiri, pilgrims, as well as non-human actors, 
statues, mirrors, talismans are fundamental mediators in organizing devotional, economic, and political networks between sacred mountains and their pantheons. Three, a successful transmission of a certain religious tradition is always based on flexibility and betrayal of the past in order to stay in tune with the necessities of the present. And last, but not the least, the uh, spreading of the uh, sons and paradigm underlines a continuous fading of the original into the copy and vice versa. In other words, the transfer of religious practices and ideas seems to underline a mechanism of infinite fragmentation and the recomposition, which produces taxonomical variations, imbalances, reduction or expansions between originals and copies, the networks of which permanently crystallize or fluidize according to the historical circumstances. Thank you very much for your attention. Kele. Okay. Okay, you got it? Yeah. Let's see. All right, um, I think this talk follows nicely from Andreas because I'll also be speaking about uh, transposition of, of sites and, and um, lineages from one place to another. And what I'd like to do in this talk is explore some similarities in the historical formation um, between Shugendo and Shinto in the Edo period. Now, first of all, why compare these two? Uh, at first blush, and depending on your perspective, these traditions may seem to have little in common. Shugendo centers on mountain worship and ascetic practices. Shinto is based on uh, worship of the kami and takes place at shrines across all landscapes. Uh, and these differences take on even greater proportions if we turn to popular perceptions. So Shugendo as the uh, ancient folk religion bound in Alpine asceticism, uh, or Shinto as tied to national ideology, nature, nature worship, the emperor uh, mythology, and, and so on. Um, in either case, these common perceptions map the historical emergence of either system. And if we pull back the layers and investigate the formation of either tradition, surprising similarities come to the surface. Uh, parallels between the two religious systems tell us as much about their shared develop elements of development as they do about the radically divergent paths they took in the modern period. Now, in thinking about Shinto, important research in recent years offers a historically rigorous antidote to modern narratives, though approaches to the historical timeline very considerably among scholars. Uh, while Helen Hardiker's recent work, for example, prefers an approach favoring continuity in the history of Shinto and looks toward ancient institutional structures for its emergence, uh, Mark Tewin, on the other hand, argues that the medieval appearance of specific terminology and a conceptual framework mark the emergence of Shinto. My own approach uh, to both Shinto and Shugendo uh, follows more closely to that of Mark Tewins. Uh, perhaps most important to me in locating the emergence of Shugendo in particular is identifying evidence of when, where, and how it became a self-conscious religious system. In other words, something that practitioners uh, self-identified with and, and was recognizable to, to others. Um, to put this paper in some context, uh, the material I'm going to share today comes out of a larger project of mine that traces the development of Shugendo over the course of the uh, late medieval and early modern periods. And I do this through the case of uh, Mount Togakshi. Um, and uh, I, I look basically at how it develops over time at this site. Um, I've got a, a book coming out on this next spring, hopefully. Um, but this research, uh, while I was doing it, it led in new directions too that I didn't anticipate. And one of those was uh, local Shinto history. Um, 
two things were especially interesting uh, in, in what I came across through the uh, historical sources. First of all, uh, it occurred in the Edo period, relatively late uh, in comparison to the, the overall history of the site. And second, I found that the means by which this Shinto presence entered tracked closely with certain Sh Shugendo developments at the site too. Um, and so today I'm gonna share a few of those examples. Um, first, I'll just give a brief uh, timeline of Shugendo at Togakushi. Uh, I have here in, in sort of gray color, this earlier date, 1458, when a major text at the site is compiled, the togakushi Sang Kenkoji Duki. It's, it's sort of a, a large engi of the site. Um, now, this text is often cited as evidence of Shugendo at this time. What I found in, in reading through it are related rituals and especially sort of a, a Mikyo uh, framework to doctrine and practice at the time, but there's no lineage, uh, no self-conscious language or conception of Shugendo at the time. Um, so my conclusion of Togakushi Shugendo is that it enters in the 1520s um, with an important figure in Shugendo known as Akubo Sokuden. Um, he transmits rituals and uh, ritual manuals to uh, top administrative clerics of the site um, in the 1520s. Um, after this, we, we find uh, growing references to practices and identity uh, in, a, in a Shugendo community there. And, and much of it kind of can be traced back to the text that Akubo uh, brought. In other words, the birth of Shugendo at this mountain rests on its lineage transmission from one mountain to another, uh, and the fact that it struck, or uh, sorry, that it stuck once transmitted. Um, now let's turn to Shinto. So first of all, uh, pre-Edo period, uh, from from the the limited sources at the site, I find uh, no kami present at the site, uh, no discourse about Shinto. Uh, there are some honji suijaku or combinatory pairs, uh, but they involve Buddhist divinities on both sides. Um, so enter Deiso Shinto. Uh, actually, there's a great panel on this uh, branch of Shinto just the other day. Outside of that, there's really been not a lot of focus on it. So I was really excited to, to see that panel and learn from it a little bit, and even um, as I was thinking about this talk. Um, so basically, um, this is a branch of Shinto that emerged in the mid 17th century at the shrine of Izuwa no Miya, which is an auxiliary to Issei's inner shrine. Uh, it was systematized in a purportedly lost copy of the Sendai Kujihongi that was discovered in a Kyoto bookshop in 1679. Now this new text known as the Sendai Kujihongi Taisei Kyo or scholars simply refer to it as the Taisei Kyo uh, among other things, positioned Deiso Shinto above the established schools of Shinto, uh, Issei, uh, Yoshida, and Imbe uh, at the time. Given the specious and disruptive nature of the text, uh, the Taisei Kyo was banned by the government within two years of its debut as an apocrypha, and that's, of course, accepted by scholars uh, today, too. Now, despite the ban on the text, Deiso Shinto circulated over the course of the 18th century, among the sites where it gained traction was Togakushi, where it arrived via one of uh, its main proponents, Cho On Dokai. Now, Dokai apparently visited the mountain in 1686 in order to pray to uh, two gods there, Tajikarao no Mikoto and Omoe Kane no Mikoto. Those are um, mouthfuls, but I'll come back to them in a moment here. Uh, Omoe Kane in particular is depicted in the Taisei Kyo as the original transmitter of Deiso Shinto, thus providing the impetus for Dokai's pilgrimage to Togakushi. Now, um, from this information alone, we find a major uh, point uh, that is similar between Shugendo and Shinto. That is, both were transmitted by an outside visitor and subsequently adopted by the community. Now, for this adoption to have occurred, uh, a good explanation was needed for the presence of both systems at the time. And here's where I want to turn to the role of narratives, uh, because in each case, it was really narratives, um, engi or origin accounts. Um, 
that provided a logic and a historical basis to kind of legitimize the presence of both of these uh, comparatively recent phenomena uh, in, in the um, Edo period. So um, here are the opening lines of a text com composed by uh, the site's chief administrator or uh, Beto at the time. Um, it's an origin account, but it's actually an origin account for uh, this branch of Shinto that he was attempting to construct, uh, Shugen Ichijutsu Deiso Shinto. Uh, that's a whole nother can of worms, but essentially he's, he's combining uh, different strands of, of things that are occurring at the site. Uh, Shugendo uh, Ichijutsu, which actually he brought in through his own uh, transmission of um, San no Ichijutsu Shinto, um, and then Deiso Shinto, which I, I spoke about a minute before. And uh, it's the first clear evidence of mythological uh, kami that we see textually at Togashi. Um, in this sense, the origin account serves an important role legitimating the uh, primordial presence of these kami. Um, and so just uh, reading the first line here, Shugen's single reality mystical source Shinto originated at Mount Togakushi, which is in the Minochi district of Shinano province. So he's setting up the, the beginnings of the Engi here. Uh, and then basically he goes into the kind of um, common uh, sort of distilled version of the Amaterasu cave myth and make sure to kind of feature the, the main deities within the narrative. And, and you'll see why here in a moment. Um, now, uh, his account of this myth may seem like standard fare, perhaps pulled from the Kojiki or Nihon Shoki, but there is one detail that gives it a slight twist. And that is that when Tajikara throws the boulder, it actually hurls through the sky and it lands on the earth and forms the mountain of Togakushi. Now this accretion to the myth comes out of the Taisekyo. So this is a, a Deiso Shinto influence here. Now, um, from this basis, a new pantheon of kami is, is sort of easily explained um, by those of the site through by, by weaving in this narrative here. Um, and, and shortly after you have this passage in the text, uh, and I just identify here these um, main deities from the uh, cave myth, uh, now they're res residing at Togachi. So you have Tajikarao at the main shrine of Okunoin. You have Omoi Kane now at um, Chuin. And then you have Uahara no Mikoto uh, at Hokoin, the, the other of the three main um, temples or shrines there. Um, Uahara doesn't come up specifically in the, the cave myth I, I mentioned before, but is a, a prominent deity in um, the Taisei Kyo. Um, so, Given there's this text and this is the earliest evidence, it, it's not to say that Joan is the inventor of these connections, um, because I, there's some signs that this is already going on and, and clearly with uh, Dokai as well, he either conceived of it himself or shortly around at that time, I think. Um, but his narrative does provide a clear and simple uh, account that then can be reconveyed by the site's clerics, uh, Tendai clerics, and Yamabushi when they're speaking to their um, confraternities or to other visitors to the site. Um, now, um, this is just to show a map of Togachi from the late Edo period, just so you can kind of visualize where these places are. Um, so here we have um, Okuno in here, Chu in here, and then Hoko in here. And each of them have their so-called uh, valleys, Tani, where, where there were sub-temples of um, Tendai clerics and Yamabushi residing. Um, okay, so here's some more evidence, but this is more on the visual side. Uh, so Honji Suijaku pairs, which I kind of referenced earlier, they're often represented, or they're often assumed to represent a latent Buddha getting attached to a uh, kami that was already at a site. Here is an example of the reverse. Uh, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas were there long before and the Akami become affixed later. So in this left image here, uh, 
this is this is a ritual uh, banner that was hung up probably at, at one of the sub temples and was used when confraternity members came uh, for for um, worship of the deities at the site. Um, and and here you see sort of the main Buddhist pantheon. So Shokanon of Okunoin uh, up top, and then going clockwise, you have Shakyamuni of Chuin, uh, Benzai Ten. Um, Yakshi Nyodai and Shogun, Shog, Shogun Jizo. Uh, and this is a pantheon that dates back to at least the 13th century based on uh, textual sources. Now, um, in comparison, we have a, a similar uh, sort of ritual uh, banner here. Um, and here, you, you just get a sense through the, the cartouches here that the kami have now been affixed to the Buddhas. So uh, as an example here, you have um, chewing, I don't know if you can see my mouse hovering around, but you've got um, uh, chewing with Shakyamuni, and then um, it is Omoi Kane no Mikoto that is in the cartouche there. Okay, and, and, and so each of them have that. Um, and uh, Benzai Ten here is associated with Kuzuryu, that's the, that's the one constant one that's consistent, that, that's the original sort of main deity of this nine headed dragon. Um, one point that I think is interesting to note is that these are contemporaneous, these two images, uh, but uh, of course the, the one on the left doesn't contain this newer kind of um, kami accretion yet. And I think that's simply because not everything is moving uniformly at the site. All of these sub temples are operating um, under the beto, but they're also semi-autonomous too, because they have their own confraternities. And so they have their own sets of rituals and whatnot. And so that's why you see some uh, asymmetry there. Um, okay, now we turn briefly to uh, the case of Shugendo, which um, uh, this occurs later in the text. And um, Karina talked about Endo Gyoja and, and his sort of use of different functions. And here's, here's one of many local versions of him being kind of used to bring in Shugendo. And so uh, here he climbs the mountain, he restores mystical source Shinto. This is that um, Shugen Ichijitsu Deso Shinto um, branch that Jolene uh, has invented. Um, then he receives the profound and ultimate secrets of both the hidden and revealed affairs from uh, uh, Fujiwara uh, Kamitari, no less. And I think this is interesting because what I learned from the, the uh, Deso Shinto panel the other day is that Kamatari plays a major role in the sort of origin myth of uh, uh, the Taisei Kyo as well. Um, on this basis, he is, uh, and Yagoja is named, um, uh, or he named it the Shugen single reality mystical source Shinto, and then he transmits it to Gakumon Gyoja, who is the original, kind of the traditional opener of the mountain. So he, in this version, he's been a little bit displaced, but still intact in, in the narrative um, by Joan. Um, now, here is an animated reenactment of that ascent, if you bear with me. Um, now, uh, I'd like to draw a few conclusions from this evidence. Um, when we compare the two cases of Shinto and Shugendo entering Togakushi, the cast is different. For example, it, with Beiso Shinto, it's kami that are being um, kind of imported in, invoked locally. In the case of Shugendo, it's the founder that provides the um, uh, origin. But in both cases, the tool of narrative is the same. Uh, and by constructing a historical narrative linking the site with the founder in the case of Shugendo and uh, deeds in the case of Shinto, Join and his comrades at Togakushi found a way to give roots to their claims. Um, now, just some sort of other similarities beyond the, the sort of narrative strand is that both uh, Deiso Shinto and Shugendo were subsidiary to the main Tendai institutional structure, um, but they, they were sort of, you know, part of it at the, at the, at the same time, and, and this was not a conflict. Um, and probably more so than the tend, Tendai um, administrative uh, function, they were part of more the popular development of the site as it's becoming a major sort of pilgrimage site, a, a way to attract more people, right? Um, now, there are, of course, differences between the two cases too. So Shugendo was given its own branch at the mountain, um, giving it 
institutional existence, uh, affiliated members, the Yamabushi, and a self-conscious identity and uh, authority at, at the site. In contrast, there was, of course, no Meso Shinto um, institutional component or priesthood created. Um, <laughs> there, there's a ban on the text, which probably speaks to some of that, but um, uh, in any case, um, it, it just sort of stayed within that uh, narrative version, but I think it did bring in these kami, which become worshipped um, by uh, the confraternities and, and the sub -tubbles. So um, my evidence for these similarities today is limited to Togakshi, but just to, to point out, I did find signs of similar patterns of kami transplants in the broader uh, Shinano and Echi Go region in this time period in, in the um, sort of middle of the Edo period. Um, also, I, I, you know, just in conversation with Andrea, it sounds something very similar happened to Gossan uh, in the 18th century, which I, I think is really fascinating too. Um, and then perhaps another place to look for future research would be Hayashi Daizan's uh, Jinja Kosho Setsu, where he uh, kind of creates uh, origin, very brief origin accounts for many sites across the country with sort of a kami uh, bent to it. Um, now, to sum up, why does this matter? Uh, Shugendo and Shinto have suffered from modern ideological lenses that remove them from historical processes and assume they existed everywhere. Putting both place and time back in focus requires us to identify the elements that actors used in the process of transmission, construction, and expansion. I found narrative, ritual, and institution to be especially relevant, and these are sort of uh, themes I, I, I flesh out in, in my book, um, but one can find other strands too. Uh, Andrea speaks of transposition, right, of, of, one, of a paradigm from one site to another. Um, in the case today, I've focused especially on how narratives really grease the wheels of transmission from a place to a place or from a story to a place. And then finally, the two systems of Shugendo and Shinto go in uh, divergent directions in the Meiji period. Shugendo is, of course, banned, and its main centers are disassembled as combinatory shrine temple complexes, while Shinto is assembled and bifurcated into national government uh, system of secular civic rights on the one hand and uh, reconstructed Shinto sects on the other. Now, incidentally, both sides of Shinto moved into and dominated the sites where uh, Shugendo and Buddhism were cleansed from. I note this because were it not for their divergent trajectories in the modern period, I think that in many ways, uh, the way that we um, look at Shinto and Shugendo would have uh, more in common than indifference um, as we look at to their histories. So I'll end with that. Thank you and uh, turn it over to Irit. Hi, thank you so much for these three fascinating papers. Uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, beautiful papers that combine beautifully too. Uh, uh, they all, well, I, actually what struck me is that all the three, your three papers uh, deal with uh, some kind of a form of trance. Everybody's trancing something. <laughs> Transforming Enogyoja into a great uh, founder and transporting, uh, transmitting Shugendo and transposing a paradigm from Kumano to, to Dewa, this, everything is trance. That means, that actually you are talking about the change, the dynamics, the flow, the constant movement and development and of, of the religious traditions uh, of, of Shugendo, especially uh, in the history of this field. So now these few, uh, the, these uh, three papers actually represent the next generation of Shugendo scholars, those who boldly go and fearlessly dig into uh, you know, historical texts and with fresh eyes and uh, unbounded by uh, preconceptions. Uh, I think you give a very good case of breaking with, uh, uh, with the past uh, uh, preconceptions of the field. 
And also uh, you are talking about the spreading of Shugendo, all of you together, uh, the development and spreading, uh, enlarging on one hand the, the original founder and also spreading uh, the, uh, the system of Shugendo either by transmitting in, into one mountain or taking a whole system, moving it to another area in Japan, which is very uh, you know, fascinating. But I saw very clear connections between those three and it's very uh, compelling uh, to see it. Well, just a few words on each current Karina's paper, because each of your papers also raises issues in the study of Japanese religions and even in the study of religion at large, you're also dealing with the big pictures. So uh, Karina's paper uh, is talking about uh, how Enogyoja is transformed from a two-liner, <laughs> from mere two lines in the eighth century and uh, actually, ongoing process of patriarchalization. I love this word, Karina, this is wonderful. It's on the process of uh, becoming like a snowballing into a colossal pillar around which Japanese religion is, <laughs> uh, has emerged. And you, know, you chose two crucial points in history to show how, uh, uh, how he was uh, actually rendered, how he was created as an uh, original source of religious authority in the 13th century and in the 20th century. It, this is very interesting also in the study of religion in general, because it uh, evaluates the pra practice of retrospective, <laughs> retrospective history or invention of tradition uh, and unravels the central and creative role of the founder in creating a religious tradition. So this is very uh, interesting. You know, in Hebrew we say, it just came to my mind. In Hebrew you say, if he didn't, invent, if he didn't exist, you should have invented him. So that's, that is a very beautifully done. Now, uh, Andrea's paper is the obvious example, example of transposing and uh, very uh, uh, interesting showing how the transposing of a system of one paradigm from one area to another uh, must be done uh, with a very great flexibility. And how do you say betrayal of the past? This is very nice. Yes, actually changing, allowing for changes and adjustments according to the local needs and, and sensibilities. And so this allows, and also these this, uh, changes that you allowed yourself mountains and, uh, and divinity, divinities exchanging places allows from this new paradigm to be free from the older one and be independent and then in turn transpose itself on Nico. This is a fascinating way uh, uh, to show how it's, you know, Shugendo influence actually, Shugendo existence actually spread around the country and how, you know, also the mechanism of its spread uh, especially by ritual, right? The ritual expansion of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, process. And uh, actually the questions you raise at the end these are fascinating and mind boggling because then you are actually showing how the process of transposition and transmission fuses the original with its copies and creates a continuous dynamic exchange, a fluid paradigm in an endless process of multi-directional fragmentation and recompositions, which seems to throw, throw me at least into a vortex inside the Taizokai mandala, which is, you know, everything. <laughs> and then, you know, Caleb's paper also, you know, he is a, a, his point is to show how a narrative uh, uh, is used to establish a tradition. And in, in, on Mount Tugakushi, this is like how uh, Shugendo and later Eiso Shinto were transmitted to uh, Togakushi, which is also very fascinating and also done by uh, the use of, or the, or the uh, you know, encouragement of narrative. You insert a narrative to create a primordial history which is you know, very much the same mechanism as Enogyoja's case. Here too, Enogyoja figures uh, uh, in, you know, inserted to give a, a authority. And uh, uh, 
the combinatory array, so Shinto in case is quite interesting. And this one paper I was trying, you know, the parallels are fascinating. I think this is like a new, uh, a new way of looking at things, how these traditions, you follow each other, use the same mechanisms and uh, merge inside each other to try to, to build themselves. History then plays different role and throws them both apart, but uh, the, the idea of the, uh, following the footsteps uh, is very interesting. Also, uh, uh, it is uh, this case teaches us a lesson about preconceptions. I mean, a mountain with no local kami, only Buddhas, <laughs> and even the dragon is imported, this is fantastic. This is a, I'm sure it's not the only one, but it's very fascinating case, right? Uh, to show how misconceptions we have about the, the history of in, in Japanese religions. Now, also one of the, the stories that the, that the text of the Reiso Shinzo tell uh, about how, you know, you create, you already have an ancient origin. So now you have to have an origin of the origin. How do you do that? You write the history of the mountain itself. Now the very mountain itself was hurled from the sky down by Tachikara Ono Mikoto. Now that is what I call transmission. <laughs> Not transmission, trans <laughs> transposition or whatever. It's transportation. This is also <laughs> you can you can establish establish authority by prior primordiality like this and. The use of narrative is very interesting. Okay, so just uh, to sum up, uh, these uh, new fresh-eyed studies illuminate historical realities once denied or ignored, and uh, they present a welcome trend of both uh, the welcome trend of both vertical, in-depth investigation of various mountains histories, but also the reciprocal connections and mutual influences of horizontal parallel nets of doctrinal and ritual systems that will sharpen and enlarge the picture. And the, the clearer the picture becomes, the more complicated it becomes. And I congratulate you for that. Uh, this is a, a, on a personal note, I have been enjoying this very much because it reminded me how fascinating the study of Shugendo is with its promise of magical powers and multiple worlds and uh, Buddha's deities, dragons and all. Thank you very much, Kokuro Samadishta. Thank you, Irit. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Irit. Um, maybe since we've only got 10, say if we go over, we can go over a little bit too, but um, minutes left, we just jump into uh, questions to get as much um, you know, participation as we can. So uh, I see um, Bernard Scheidt has his hand up. So yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and hi to everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I have a, a specific uh, question to Caleb uh, regarding join. Uh, whom you mentioned as um, as an important figure, um, obviously in the background of uh, of, of 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 your cults. Um, he's of course, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, he's one of the big names also in Sano Ichichi to Shinto, Shinto, isn't he? So he is. Um, I mean, man, many things that we know about. Yes, and his implication are actually uh, from works by, by this join, if I'm not wrong. Is, is it the same? Yeah. And uh, That's which, right. which, which implies uh, that there must be strong, strong ties between Togakushi and uh, Kaneji or the tender establishment in Edo. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, and in, in, if, if, if this is correct, then um, uh, you see, and you, you might probably um, also, um, I mean, now uh, in Irit's uh, comments, it seems that everything is possible, isn't it? <laughs> 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 and uh, here, but if we, if we look at the, uh, 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 the persons who, uh, at the age, uh, agents uh, who are involved, you see 
these are people of a certain authority and it's probably these uh, authorities in the background who allow or disallow certain connections and i think it's important to uh, to uh, point out, 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 out these authority uh, issues so um i would actually uh add to what Caleb explained that it's maybe no um coincidence uh, that that this tender establishment or the shinto part of the tender establishment tried to enlarge itself by uh by uh, by interfering in what's going on in uh, in Shugendo, probably in in opposition to that kind of anti-Buddhist uh, Shintoization that uh, we were de describing in our panel. Uh, might that be correct, Carl? Um, yeah, thanks for your comments. Uh, Jiongin is, is such a fascinating figure and sort of a real enigma to me because um, he does, he is very elite. He comes from Kanneji um, because as you, as you mentioned, Togakshi is a direct branch temple um, of Kanneji. And um, he, he may be the, the sole uh, recipient. I haven't found uh, evidence of other um, priests who are initiated and do San no Ichijitsu Shinto. Um, and in fact, he's, he's a strange figure because he becomes quite, uh, her heretical, like um, he um, sort of brings in Deiso Shinto, which has been banned. Why is he doing this as a top cleric? And then, um, based on other evidence later at the site, he tries to actually um, bring about, you know, full scale uh, um, institutional um, reformations at, at Togakshi to Shugendo, which is very strange. And there's this whole um, uprising against him, mm -hmm. and he ends up becoming exiled. Uh, mm -hmm. Although there is this sort of underground following uh, of him, because all of these works that he writes remain, and and the sort of evidence trickles of evidence here and there. So yeah, it's hard to easily explain him. But um, uh, thanks for for the question because it gives me a chance to give a little bit more background on him. Yeah, in this particular case. Okay. Um, and I see Claudia has a hand up. Yes, thanks to for this fascinating uh, panel, and uh, everything be interesting. Uh, of course, uh, a lot, uh, uh, a lot of stuff uh, to say. Uh, I have a question for you, and one for Andrea. Not, nothing for Karina, but was interesting uh, <laughs> a lot. And uh, reg for you, regarding this. Uh, we were we were talking about this uh, expansion of the sugar and as a quite a, uh, brand uh, fit to branding new places you know, in the Edo Jedi. It means that expanding with yes with Sokuden as a, a main uh, author and uh, from the ritual point of view and expanding in many places. But I was wondering regarding uh, uh, Tugaguchi, to what extent they uh, uh, work out in extending their network. I think the the, the question was to expand the dan the dan to get much more, more of the Kanshin stuff, much uh, uh, money to, to bring much economy in the in the place. To this operation, no? to bring the, the shukendo into Gakushi. To what extent? Uh, to what extent extended the network of uh, mm, the the Togakushi dan? Uh, where it arrived in, in Edo, I don't know. Uh, for, ex for example, Iko-san arrived uh, in Kagoshima as well. There, there was people in Kagoshima or in uh, Yamaguchi. To what extent there is a, an expansion of the uh, the Togagoshi network after the Shugendo transformation uh, inclusion in the in the if uh, you know uh, regarding uh, to Andrea, uh, I, I was wondering. Uh, when they changed in, in uh, when they became independent from Kumano, there were the realities still connected with Kumano, Gongen, uh, a little bit conflicting in the uh, on in the ground in the same area with Dewa Sanzan. 
uh, when Deva Sanzana acquired some um, enough power to be independent, there was some remaining. Uh, to what extent there was conflict in this uh, uh, self affirmation of the Deva Sanzana? Okay, <laughs> this is this are my question. Thank you again. Grazie, Claudio. Caleb, you go first. I go after you. I go. Well, um, see, uh, I would say until the, if, if we look at the Engi of uh, the Sanza Engi of the, um, Deva Sanza Engi of the 17th century, we still see that this arrival of the uh, Kumano Sanza Gongen to the Deva Sanza is still depicted. So, as you said, Claudio, there, there is always this need to borrow the charisma of the origin, the charisma of Kumano. It's, it's never hard, no? You always want it. So there is this connection still there, at least in the 17th century uh, Engi Mono that, uh, Engi that we have. Then later on, there is, at the same time, there is also this direction of a, um, detaching, removing from the original source. So as, as Irit said, when Irit mentioned the, the tides of Kai, the Congo Kai, there is the, or the, the, if we think about the tides of Kai, I mean, we see this centripetal and centrifugal movement toward the center, at the same time toward the periphery. You wanna go there, you wanna be the center, the center you wanna be everywhere. This, this is what I was thinking about with crystallization or fluidification. There is probably Miyake, Sensei, and stuff that, that, that old generation of Shugendo scholars, they emphasize a lot the, the crystallization. Mm? The Shugendo crystallizes in a certain position. It's a nice picture, everybody wants to see it. Same time, it's fluid, as also Karina mentioned in, uh, when talking about you know, Gyoja, no? it's a continuous trip on both directions. Thank you, Claudio, for the great question. Grazie. Um, Claudia, thanks for your question. In terms of the, the spread of Shugendo from Togachi, it remains pretty limited. Uh, what happens, what I, what I think happens as, as Shugendo is spreading throughout the country in the Edo period is you have the, the Honzon and, and Tozan branches that are kind of taking over the, the plains and cities. But then you have, you know, already institutionally powerful centers like um, like Haguro and um, like Hikosan and Togakshi that uh, are, are, are going to resist Honzan, right, Shogoin. Um, and so all, all of those mountains kind of uh, through Tendai, through Kaneji, um, kind of are able to establish their own branch. And then that protects their own Yamabushi because all of a sudden now they're licensed, you know, uh, and, and they can practice. So um, in Edo period, you have some um, Togakshi Yamabushi practicing in different parts of Shinano and Echigo, but it's, it's pretty limited to that. But essentially by having their own branch, which is established, I think it's 1707, they now at least have their territory and are protected from um, the Honzon branch, which is encroaching uh, in, in the 17th century. So thank you. Um, looks like we're near time. I've seen some other panels go over a bit, so if anyone wants to stick around for if there's another question or so, how, how do you all feel? If not, we can close it out here too. Um, okay, great. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention in the beginning um, is that uh, just, just to sort of throw in a plug for um, the book that just came out, Defining Shugendo, and Andrea and Karina are actually, actually editors on it. Do you have your books you can show up uh, in front of the cameras if you want? There we go. Um, beautiful jacket. So uh, we all have um, articles in there too. So if you're interested in learning more, you can uh, visit Bloomsbury or, or maybe Amazon too. Um, and uh, thank you so much everyone for attending. This has been really fun. And I look forward to seeing you at other panels over the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Irit, for your great comments. Thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful. It's wonderful. It's too short. I wanted more. <laughs> I want more of you guys. Um, mm -hmm.
Uh, what what uh, panel were you talking with uh, Bernard Chard about? I think I missed it. Oh, um, there was a couple. There's one on Deso Shinto a couple days ago, uh -huh. which I was just surprised to see that because it's it's so obscure. But Sonihara Satoshi has been kind of the main scholar working on this. So, uh, and he's worked on Togakushi a lot too. So he's his research has been really useful for me. Um, and I then just before our panel, um, Bernard had, uh, he was with a few others and they did, they had a panel on domain info, and that was really interesting actually. Um, yeah. yeah, so oh, it's been great. a lot sort of an early modern Shinto, this conference. Yeah. Yeah. Can't have them all. Claudio, you're asking a question? Still have the hand. <laughs> Ah, I don't know. Is, is the, the, that the, happened the, to me the other day too? I didn't, I didn't count. It's, no, a it's, Roman, okay. it's a Roman salutation. <laughs> yeah, yes, but the, it's not. Poly, I'm. Uh, uh, there is not. There is the. the there is in the other uh, way to to to, <laughs> to put the end. Unfortunately, so I am more left wing. <laughs> Thank you, guys, very much. To all. It was really interesting. It was really fascinating and uh, to trying to find out everything. Well, I didn't even talk about all the connections I've seen, but you know, you know them yourself. <laughs> it is, a, <laughs> it is, it was really a, thank you so much for inviting me too. This is a, it's been a pleasure. And uh, 